yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. It was a Sunday morning on December the 7th, 1941, on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Moored just off Ford Island, lined up in a row, were eight battleships of the United States Pacific Fleet, aptly named Battleship Row. Deployed from San Diego in the spring of 1940, along with three aircraft carriers and other protection and service vessels, these impressive warships were the embodiment of American naval pride. But the silence would soon be shattered, as the Navy personnel and their families stationed at Pearl Harbor heard the unmistakable drone of hundreds of aircraft. They belonged to the land of the rising sun, the Empire of Japan. It was a day that would live in the minds of many Americans. I'm Liam Smith with Agent Smith Voice Productions, and in today's World War II documentary, I discuss the story of the events leading up to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. At the dawn of the 20th century, the Empire of Japan had proven to the Western world a formidable military force. In 1905, it defeated the Russian Empire in the Russo-Japanese War and formed an alliance with the Allied powers during the First World War. Thanks to the assistance of the Japanese, 
the Allies secured a key victory in routing out Imperial German forces in Asia, further cementing their position as one of the world's leading military powers. Two years after the end of hostilities in 1918, Japan joined the League of Nations in 1920 as a charter representative and one of the four permanent members of the League Council. After seeing a rapid surge in modernization, along with becoming a democracy, the Japanese wanted to be treated with equality and believed that their newfound democratic policies would align them with Western society. However, Japan found itself to be rejected by the West, and the outdated military tradition in the country was still an ongoing presence. Many Japanese revered their emperor as the essence of a living god. Then, in 1929, after the American Wall Street crash triggered a monetary depression that affected the Japanese economy, the public turned towards the emperor and the army for guidance. To solve the crisis, the army believed the answer lied in the creation of a powerful Japanese empire. But in the Imperial Japanese Army are two bitterly opposed ideological factions, the Kodoha, the Imperial Wei faction, and the Toseha, the control faction. The Kodoha wished to settle an old rivalry with the Soviet Union, whilst the Toseha believed that invading China would provide essential natural resources that Japan desperately needed to fuel its growing empire. Along with this mindset, the Toseha favored European-style military tactics and methods. Inspired by the rise of German militarism is the son of a revered samurai and a general in the Imperial Japanese Army, Hideki Tojo. A fanatical nationalist, his dream was a Japanese empire spanning Asia. His colleagues nickname him the Razor. Siding with the Toseha faction, Tojo would eventually crush all opposition with ruthless precision by utilizing the Japanese military police, the Kempeitai. Japan would soon set her sights to solve the solution to its growing economical and financial crisis in the Chinese province of Manchuria. Manchuria was a land rich with the necessary resources such as grain, coal, oil, and iron. On September the 18th, 1931, and without even informing their elective democratic government, Imperial Japanese forces captured the capital of Mukden and eventually the rest of the region. This invasion was in response to the Mukden incident, a false flag event staged by Japanese military personnel as a pretext for the invasion of Manchuria. In February 1932, the Japanese established a puppet state, Manchukuo, at the League of Nations in Geneva, an international summit was held, where the other major world powers agreed to help China repel Japan's aggressive militarism. Yosuke Matsuka, the Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs, read a fiery speech in defense of Japan's actions in Manchuria and announced the country's withdrawal from the League of Nations. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the adopted by the assembly. After the conclusion of the speech, Matsuka just walked out of the room, and the League of Nations realized there was nothing they could do. The Empire of Japan soon sought out other opportunities to take supplies. They were available in the regions controlled by the European colonial powers, Britain, France, and the Dutch. Although ripe for the picking, Japan had to be exceptionally cautious because it didn't want to arouse the attention of the United States. America possessed territory in the Philippines and other islands such as Guam, Wake, and Midway, 
Whilst it had the industrial might and strength to take on Japan, the US was insistent on not being involved in another European conflict. Its economy had exploded during the Roaring Twenties, along with exporting vast amounts of resources to other countries. It also signed a naval reduction treaty with Britain, France, and Japan. This, in effect, allowed the Imperial Japanese Navy to roam the Pacific unchallenged, as they took it upon themselves to ignore the treaty by eventually withdrawing from the League of Nations. But with the onset of the Great Depression and after the capture of Manchuria in 1931, the Imperial Japanese Army set their sights to further expansions in China. This would prove to be an easier achievement than first realized. China was embroiled in a state of civil war, with Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of China battling the Chinese Communist Party under the leadership of Mao Zedong. In July 1937, Tojo's Kwantan Army invoked an incident with Chinese troops and launched an invasion. During this assault, they won victory after victory. All the while, the Japanese carried out various atrocities, such as the incident at Nanking and the infamous attack on the US gunboat Panay, which was sunk by Japanese bombers. For these aggressive actions, Japan received widespread condemnation from the League of Nations, but the Western powers refused to intervene in the situation. By 1939, however, the war in China eventually reached a stalemate, as the Chinese began utilizing guerrilla tactics, which significantly strained Japanese manpower and supplies. Concerned by Japan's growing militarism, President Roosevelt suggested that a naval blockade would solve this issue. It has become clear that acts and policies of nations in other parts of the world have far-reaching effects on us. But the British were completely opposed to the idea because they believed that such naval restrictions would drag them into conflict with Japan. The Soviet Union did very little to intervene with the problem either, besides dealing with several small skirmishes with Japanese-occupied Manchuria. To prevent this from escalating any further, Japan signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union on April the 13th. 1941. Japan's first actions towards war with the United States came in August 1940. Looking at the military successes of Nazi Germany in Poland and France, the Japanese believed this was something they could emulate in their conquest of the Pacific. They acted by seizing air bases in the French colony of Indochina. It was exactly what Roosevelt had anticipated. However, he wanted to avoid the use of force, but he could still bring the hammer down hard. Thus, he sent Japan a warning by moving the United States Pacific Fleet, stationed in California, to the Hawaiian Islands. He figured that by situating the fleet in Pearl Harbor, he could then intervene if the Japanese invaded the colonies of defeated European powers and the Philippines or the Dutch East Indies. However, the naval commander in charge of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Richardson, disagreed with Roosevelt's decision. He believed that the fleet was not prepared and Roosevelt removed him from command. Roosevelt also imposed harsh restrictions which freeze all American financial exports to Japan, with one resource in particular, oil. Japan received 80% of their oil exports from America, and with that supply now threatened, it would force them to take drastic action. The restrictions deal a massive blow to the Japanese, and Roosevelt would only reverse this if Japan discontinues its expansion into Asia. 
It appears this was a brilliant move, but in actuality, the ramifications of this would only serve to lead Japan into conflict with the United States. To make matters more complicated, Japan signs an agreement with Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy, known as the Tripartite Pact. It created a defense alliance between the countries, and was largely directed at the United States from entering World War II. Whilst many of the Japanese supported this decision, not everyone agreed. If there was one man highly opposed to the Japanese military aggression throughout China, and the signing of the Berlin Pact, it was the commander of the Japanese combined fleet, Isoroko Yamamoto. A brilliant naval strategist, Yamamoto was against engaging in a war with the Allies, particularly the United States. Yamamoto had spent two tours in the USA, studied at Harvard University, and knew of the immense industrial might of America. He knew that the Empire of Japan could not win in a long war of attrition against the United States. His way of thinking caused many of Japan's nationalists believing him to be too moderate and had targeted him for assassination. Thus, he was sent out to sea to avoid this fate by being reassigned as the commander of the Japanese combined fleet by acting Navy Minister Mitsumasa Yoni. However, on October the 18th, 1941, the political situation quickly took a new direction in Japan when the civilian Prime Minister, Funimaro Kano, a peacemaker and diplomat, failed to overcome Hideki's popularity in cabinet. With the possibility of war with the United States now unavoidable, he chooses to resign. Tojo is then appointed in his place as Prime Minister. The Japanese Naval General Staff give Yamamoto approval for the plan of attack. The obvious place to attack America was in the colony of the Philippines, en route south towards the rich laden oil fields that Japan was desperately seeking to obtain. But Yamamoto's war strategy was more audacious. He contemplated that the only way for Japan to succeed is to launch a surprise strike at the Pacific Fleet, now stationed at Pearl Harbor. The Japanese knew Pearl Harbor was an operation that had to be meticulously planned. They had to decide on which aircraft to utilize and identify the specific targets. However, some of this intelligence for the mission had to be collected from the ground. There were many Japanese residents on Hawaii, and one of them was a spy working for the Imperial Japanese Navy. His name was Takeo Yoshikawa. Posing as a tourist, he gathered vital intelligence by taking photographs with his camera. He observed the everyday movements of the ships and aircraft down to the smallest possible detail. Yoshikawa had also confirmed that Sunday would be the best possible time to attack because he knew the surprise element would be magnified tenfold. Whilst this surprise element was vital for the success of the operation, it could also go seriously wrong. Pearl Harbor was 3,000 miles from Japan. It would take them 12 days, and on one of those days, they could be detected. The chance of pulling off this operation would be very slim indeed. Yamamoto's strike plan for Pearl Harbor involved six large wooden deck aircraft carriers, which combined could hold over 450 combat aircraft. He would utilize these aircraft carriers to launch multiple waves of attack, systematically identifying and destroying specific ships, aircraft, airfields, and dry docks. It would be the largest concentration of naval air power in the world at that time. However, there were numerous obstacles in the way of Yamamoto's ambition. Pearl Harbor was situated in a shallow stretch of water. This presented a problem for the Nakajima B-5N2 torpedo bomber. The Americans called this aircraft a Kate. During training exercises, it was observed that the torpedoes after being dropped in the shallow water would become embedded in the sea floor. Eventually, Japanese engineers would develop a more advanced version of the Type 91 torpedo, utilizing a new angular control system that was highly sophisticated for the time. 
They also fixed wooden panels to the ends of the torpedo, which detached upon hitting the water and absorbed the initial impact of the weapon, allowing it to travel in shallow water. The results of this new weapon would prove to exceed all expectations. Before the attack on Pearl Harbor began, in Washington, D.C., American intelligence had managed to crack the Japanese communication codes. Knowing from these intercepts about an impending attack, Washington alerts all military forces in the Pacific with the following message. This dispatch is to be considered a war warning. The Admiral of the Pacific Fleet, Husband Kimmel, addressed the statement with his executive staff. They came to the conclusion that the Japanese are planning an attack on specific areas, but Pearl Harbor was not included. He believed that he would have to utilize the Pacific Fleet to assist the areas that Japan was going to attack. What was more surprising when I was researching this topic is that the army head of the naval base, General Short, believed that the Japanese would attack Pearl Harbor from within by committing acts of sabotage. To counter this, he issued an order to the airfields to place all the aircraft on the center of the tarmac. This faithful decision would come back to haunt him. Also, what is interesting to note is that Japanese embassies were destroying all secret coding machines and documents related to the operation. The news of this destruction was sent to the Pacific Fleet in Hawaii. Commander Husband Kimmel read this message and assumed that the Japanese are burning all evidence is because they think that America is going to strike first. What the Americans didn't realize is that on November the 26th, 1941, the entire Japanese naval air fleet under the command of Admiral Nagumo had departed the Korea Islands. Overseeing the operation on the battleship Nagato, Yamamoto ordered this powerful fleet to set sail for Hawaii. It consisted of six aircraft carriers, two battleships, three cruisers, nine destroyers, eight tankers, 23 submarines, and five midget submarines. Some of the difficulties the Japanese experienced when they traveled across the Pacific was the unpredictable weather and the pitching and rolling of the aircraft carriers meant that it would be difficult for their aircraft to take off. In order to keep the operation secretive, strict radio silence was observed and the biggest risk was that a non-Japanese vessel or aircraft could have radioed their position and heading. What many people don't know is that the Japanese fleet were actually spotted, not by any American ship, but by a Soviet transport vessel, the Yurutsky, carrying land-lease items back to the USSR. The strike force had specific orders that if they came across any non-Japanese vessel, they were to destroy it immediately. However, Vice Admiral Nagumo decided to let the vessel go unmolested in order to maintain the non-aggression pact between Japan and the Soviet Union. On the morning of December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese had reached their destination. Before departing the carriers, the Japanese pilots wrote their wills, took one last ceremonial drink as the first sortie of aircraft were prepared for the upcoming raid. The attack on Pearl Harbor was about to begin. Yeah! 
first wave of aircraft soon departed their aircraft carriers and headed towards their target. At 7.02 a.m., two privates, Joseph Lockhart and George Elliott, were on watch at the radar post on Apana Mountain. They were just about to leave their shift when suddenly a large blob of aeroplanes appeared on the screen. Five minutes later, Private Lockhart reported his findings to the watch officer, and this is what he said. Excuse me, sir, this is Private Lockhart. I believe a large flight of planes are approaching slightly east of north of Oahu at a distance of about 130 miles. The watch officer infamously responded by saying, you don't need to worry about that. They're probably just a flight of B-17 bombers coming in from California. The privates had in fact spotted 183 planes heading towards Oahu. They comprised of the first wave of Japanese aircraft. At 7.55 a.m., the planes arrived at Pearl Harbor. Led by First Fleet Wave Commander Mitsuo Fushida, the force perched above their unsuspecting targets. Breaking radio silence, Fushida shouted the phrase, Tora, 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 or Tiger, Tiger, Tiger. This coded signal meant that total surprise had been achieved. The Japanese aircraft commenced their attack, and the men of the Pacific Fleet are just beginning to stir. Many of them are unaware of the imminent danger, attributing the aircraft as Navy or Army pilots conducting training exercises. It was not until the first explosions boom across the harbor do they realize that something is horribly wrong. The Japanese had caught the Americans by complete surprise. strike at the airfields first, taking out the aircraft sitting smack bang in the middle of the tarmac. Thanks to the orders of General Short, the aircraft are sitting ducks for the Mitsubishi A6M Zero fighters and the Achi D3A1 dive bombers. It was this aircraft, which the Americans called a VOW, that carried the Type 98 250kg land bomb. Japanese were ordered to strafe and destroy as many parked aircraft and hangars as possible. This was vital to the mission, as any American plane that managed to take off from the ground and locate the Japanese fleet would have been a catastrophe. However, some American pilots, such as Phil Rasmussen and Kenneth M. Taylor, managed to take off from the ground and dogfight the Zero fighters. Rasmussen shot down a Zero fighter, whilst Taylor shot down two dive bombers. After destroying hundreds of aircraft, the Japanese dive bombers and torpedo bombers head for their primary target, Battleship Row. Within minutes of the attack, several ships were severely damaged. The assault only intensifies as the Japanese unveil their new Type 91 torpedoes with their specialized wooden fins, along with the improved Type 99 800kg anti-ship and Type 98 250kg land bombs. Signalman 2nd Class Richard E. Burge, aboard the USS Tennessee, described the following. I watched the fleet get destroyed right before my eyes. The USS West Virginia and USS Oklahoma took several torpedoes. The West Virginia sank alongside us. The USS Oklahoma, which was anchored forward of the USS West Virginia, capsized completely. The USS Maryland forward of us took a bomb, and its bow submerged beneath the surface. Moments later, the Japanese attacked the battleship USS Arizona with torpedo bombers. Besides carrying torpedoes, some of these aircraft were equipped with the Type 99 800kg anti-ship bomb. One of these bombs struck the forward magazine of the warship. The result was an instantaneous explosion. The hull of the ship was lifted clear out of the water. In just a few seconds, 1,177 sailors perished in the inferno and flooding. It was the single most devastating explosion of the entire raid. Once the initial shock and surprise of the attack had passed, the sailors manned their systems and started to fight back. There are various stories of bravery 
For example, Dory Miller, a famous African-American United States Navy cook, third class, was called to the bridge of the USS West Virginia to remove the wounded captain, Mevrin Bennion. Bennion refused to leave his post, so Miller went outside onto the deck of the ship. With the assistance of Lieutenant Frederick H. White and Ensign Victor Delano, he was taught how to operate the anti-aircraft machine guns aft of the conning tower. Miller fired the gun until it ran out of ammunition. He was credited with downing two Japanese planes and helping move wounded sailors through oil and water to the quarterdeck. For his actions, Miller was awarded the Navy Cross, the highest decoration of valor in combat after the Medal of Honor. The second wave of the Japanese strike force took off from their aircraft carriers at 7.15 a.m. They consisted of 54 torpedo bombers, 78 dive bombers, and 38 Zero fighters, whilst 36 Zeros remained on the aircraft carriers to provide support by order of Admiral Nagumo should the need arise. By the time the second wave appeared over Pearl Harbor, the Japanese aircraft were met with heavy resistance from anti-aircraft guns. Ammunition lockers had managed to be accessed, and the Marines were firing up at the assailants. Many of the losses sustained by the Japanese aircraft during the attack were from anti-aircraft guns. The ammunition lockers had been under lock and key due to fears of sabotage. For one American watching the events unfold, the attack was more than just a horrific disaster. Admiral Husband Kimmel, who had organized to play golf with Admiral Schultz later that day, walked next to the window of his office with his Navy uniform only partially buttoned and beheld the destruction. As he watched the attack unfolding before him, a spent 50 caliber machine gun bullet slammed through the glass, cutting through his white jacket and leaving a welt on his chest. He later famously said, it would have been merciful had it killed me. Kimmel had missed a vital opportunity to spring into action that morning. Roughly around 30 minutes before the commencement of the attack, he received a telephone call providing confirmation that a Japanese Type A midget submarine had been detected at 3.57 a.m. by the destroyer USS Ward. Despite this vital message being received, Kimmel had failed to prepare for an imminent Japanese attack. By 9.45 a.m., the attack had concluded. In just two hours, the Japanese had destroyed 320 American aircraft and 19 Navy ships. In total, 2,403 Americans perished in the attack. The Japanese lost 29 aircraft, in addition to five midget submarines. Over 129 Japanese would lose their lives, with the exception of Kazuo Sakamaki, who was taken as America's first prisoner of war after his Taipei midget submarine caught on a reef and sank. Another important factor was that just two hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan declared war on the United States and the British Empire. The Japanese government had originally intended to deliver the declaration approximately 30 minutes before the commencement of the attack. However, the Japanese embassy in Washington had failed to deliver the message in time due to taking too long to decode the 5,000-word declaration. With elements of the Pacific Fleet now damaged or destroyed, the Japanese could push ahead with their assault in the South Pacific. In just 24 hours, they moved with lightning force, seizing the Philippines, Malaya, Hong Kong, and in a matter of weeks, the rich oil field of the Dutch East Indies. Many Japanese commanders celebrate the victory in Pearl Harbor, but the mastermind behind the attack, Isoroko Yamamoto, falls into a deep depression because he knew that some of the critical targets had not been destroyed, such as vital oil facilities and submarine pens, including the most important target of the mission. By mere chance, the three American Pacific Fleet aircraft carriers had been out at sea conducting training exercises. Whilst many of his colleagues dismissed this as unimportant, Yamamoto understood the significance of the potency of air power at sea. 
it was these aircraft carriers that would come back to haunt the Imperial Japanese Navy and deal significant damage at Midway just seven months later, destroying four of the six aircraft carriers that had originally attacked Pearl Harbor. The strike upon Pearl Harbor had deeply shocked the Americans. Far from being forced into submission as many Japanese commanders had anticipated, it had the complete opposite effect. On December the 8th, 1941, President Roosevelt seizes the opportunity to rally the nation. In a speech to Congress, he announces a declaration of war against the Empire of Japan. His words were met with a thunderous round of applause. The American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Meanwhile in Berlin, the Japanese ambassador Oshima demanded that Adolf Hitler declared war on America. He also hinted that Japan might revoke the non-Japanese Soviet aggression pact if Germany went to war with the United States. Nazi Germany and fascist Italy had signed the Tripartite Pact, but this only bound them to go to war if one of the others was attacked. Yet despite this agreement, and swayed by Oshima's words, on December the 11th, 1941, Adolf Hitler addressed the Reichstag and declared war on the United States. It would be one of his greatest strategic blunders. Soon after this announcement, Bonito Mussolini followed with a declaration of war against America. Less than a week after the attack on Pearl Harbor, with the nation now unified and ready to fight, a plan was being formulated to hit the Japanese mainland. On April the 18th, 1942, by utilizing two of the aircraft carriers, America strikes back by hitting Tokyo. This was the famous Doolittle Raid. In just three months after Pearl Harbor, half of the warships believed to have been deemed unserviceable were recommissioned and returned to active service. Only three were officially out of action. If there was one man who understood the importance of the American entrance into the conflict, it was the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. He stated, So, we have won after all. The full industrialized might of America would now be unleashed in World War II.